Good morning. It is lovely to be here. It is my great privilege and honor to stand here today and welcome you to worship as your new minister. Friday evening was a very blessed occasion for uh, my family and indeed for you as a congregation in Clagan and indeed uh, in Orator as well. And I do want to thank everyone who helped in any way to make the service possible, from stewarding to music, singing, sound, visuals, uh, the supper for my family afterwards. It was all greatly appreciated. And also can we thank everyone who has called, whether to the manse or on the phone or indeed left us cards and gifts uh, for the flowers last night. Your kindness and generosity really, truly is greatly touching and greatly appreciated. Uh, As I said last night, Hannah and I uh, are loving living in the manse. It's a beautiful home. And again, I want to thank uh, Morris, Eric and all the team who've been involved in making the manse uh, ready for us to move in. Hannah and I are very much looking forward to getting to know you all in the days, weeks, months ahead and being a part of these fellowships. It might take us a wee while to get your names or make the connections. I know there are many connections. Uh, and if we do forget your name, please do remind us of it, uh, even if you think we do know it. I remember in Temple Patrick, I called a lady by her neighbor's name for nearly a year before my uh, ex-boss told me what her name was. So please don't allow us to do that. Just let us know, uh, and we'd love to get to know you as soon as possible. Uh, this week I am planning to do some district visitation, uh, preferably outside, outside, masks, social distancing, all the rest of it. Uh, but I really do want to get to know you as, as much as possible. Uh, but don't worry, if you don't want me inside or anything like that, or you don't want me to call, I'll not be offended, okay? I understand this is the time we live in. But if you just want to give me a wee call, or indeed your elder, just so they're aware. That I do have new details. Uh, the numbers should have been coming up in the announcement sheets. But there are also we calling cards in the vestibule if you would like to take one as well for my contact details. Some people have been asking me, what do I call you? Well, my mum gave me the name James, and I'm fairly happy with that. Uh, Some of my friends would call me Jock or Jimmy, but honestly, whatever is most comfortable to you. As the boy says, call me whatever you like as long as it's not too early in the morning. I jest. (laughs) But please don't feel like you have to call me the Reverend or Mr. Porter. James is fine. And we look forward to worship next Sunday at 10.45 as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. This morning we're starting a series looking at the book of Galatians, a powerful book written by the Apostle Paul to the Galatian church. It has been described as Martin Luther's book as it was instrumental in his conversion and he leaned heavily upon it in his writing and preaching in his day. You see, it becomes becomes apparent, as we're going to see, that many had lost their way in Galatia, as many have indeed today. They followed a false gospel that these false teachers had taught. However, Paul makes it clear that Christ has fulfilled all, all the law's requirements for us by his life and finished work upon the cross. And that is true for us today. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot work our way into heaven. It is not about us. It is all about Christ who is able to save. And it is his gospel that we preach. And as Jesus himself declared in our call to worship from Luke chapter 4 verses 18 to 21. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so therefore with the truth, that Christ has fulfilled all the law's demands by proclaiming God's, uh, God's gospel of good news. Let us stand together to sing our opening hymn of praise. You're the word of God the Father from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand.
Well, let us unite our hearts together in our prayers of adoration and confession. Heavenly Father, we come before you in awe of your greatness. We bow in wonder at your splendor, holiness, as our gracious King and Lord of every man. Father, we adore you as the author of creation. For before the world began, every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. Lord, you've created all things, the beauty of this world, the flowers, fields, seas, trees, the universe, and each one of us. But not only that, you also sustain everything, for all creation holds together by the power of your voice. You provide all our world needs, the sun, rain, wind, and warmth. You provide food in abundance, shelters over our heads. Lord, every good and perfect gift comes from heaven above. And for all this and so much more, we give you our praise, thanks, and adoration. Yet, Father, we're mindful that compared to you, we are sinners in thought, word, and deed. For that's why you came into our world and left the gaze of angels. Because you saw that we couldn't keep your perfect law. You saw that every inclination of our human heart is evil continually. Lord, we confess that we're sinners in need of your grace. We're totally unable to do anything about our sin, but we know that Christ is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, in this stillness, we confess to you our personal sins. Merciful Father, forgive us, we pray. Remove our sins from us and remember them no more, as your word says. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to seek and save the lost, that you exchanged the joy of heaven for the anguish of a cross. You poured out your blood upon the cross so that when we repent and turn away from our sin and trust in you, we're free and forgiven from our sins completely. The guilty may go free. O oh Lord, thank you for our salvation. Help us, Holy Spirit, to live for Christ in all we do. Help us to sin no more and trust in your unfailing love. And may we tell others of your amazing, life-changing gospel. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's lovely to see you all again this morning. And uh, you're, um, I hope you're all keeping well. Yeah. All doing okay? Brilliant, great. Well, I'm your new minister, James, and, I'm, and my wife Hannah is over here, and we're going to be getting to know you a lot better in the days, weeks, and months ahead, and it's lovely to see you out at church this morning. But I wonder, hands up, who's back to school? Yeah, everybody's back to school. Do you like being back to school? Yeah, some of you do, some of you don't. No, no, no. Are you enjoying it? Brilliant, fantastic. Well, my wife is a teacher and she's not really happy about being back to school, but you have to go back sometime, don't you? But you know, boys and girls, there are lots of things you need to get ready before you go back to school, isn't there? And I have a few things with me. What would you need to put things into and put on your back? What would you need for your back? Yes, a school bag. You're absolutely right. And I have my school bag with me. Can you tell me what team I'm supporting? Liverpool, yes. <laughs> and hopefully we do a lot better this season, but I know some of you don't agree. <laughs> but I have my school bag with me. So I have a few things in here. Let me think. What would I need, boys and girls, if I was going to write or draw or rule? What would I need? Yeah. Pencils and rulers and stuff. So I have my pencil case all filled with Pepex and pencils, rulers, and all sorts of things. Brilliant. Okay. Let me think. What else might I need? I know. What if I got hungry? What do you think I would need if I was hungry? Yeah. Does anybody know? What would I need if I was hungry? No doubt your mummy or daddy has packed it for you. 
Crisps. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe not your healthy option. Is that what they talk about nowadays? <laughs> What's that? Lunchbox. You're absolutely right. I have my lunchbox and Hannah has some things in there packed for me. Brilliant. Now, what if I was thirsty? What do I need? Yes. A water bottle. Brilliant. Yes, so I have my water bottle all filled here as well. And you know what? You know, you might need a few other things whenever you're going to school. For instance, now I'm a minister, so I don't really go to school. Well, unless I'm doing assembly, so I would need my Bible. But, you know, I moved to this part of the world and I might need a dictionary because I quite can't understand the accent around Mid Ulster. But I have that with me. And also, I also have a textbook with me. And this is my Greek textbook. Does anybody speak Greek here? No, either do I. It's all Greek to me. But, you know, I have my textbook as well. So you need to have all your stuff ready for you in your bag, okay, for school. It's important to be ready. But let me ask you another question. Has your teacher set a spellings test or sums test this week? Yes, okay, some of you have, some of you don't. And it's really important, isn't it, to be ready for that spellings or sums test, to know what the right answer is. It's important to be ready. But you know, in the Bible, boys and girls, there's a story told about Jesus, and he was a great teacher. He was teaching his disciples really important things about God and about how to live and about heaven and all these great things. And then he asked them a question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Or who do people say I am? And some of the disciples put up their hand and said, pick me. Some say you're John the Baptist. Was that right, boys and girls? No, that wasn't right. Another one said, some say you're Elijah. That wasn't right either. Another person said, some say you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But were they right, boys and girls? No, they weren't right at all. So then Jesus asked them, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You think Peter got it right, boys and girls? Is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God? Yeah, he is, absolutely. And Jesus said, you are right, Peter. You didn't learn this from other people. It was taught to you by my Father in heaven. You see, boys and girls, the disciples learned a very important lesson that we all need to learn. It's important that we are all ready to know Jesus and live for him in our lives. To know him as our saviour, the Christ, our friend. And we do that by asking Jesus into our lives to forgive us from our sins. And when we do that, God promises to forgive us. He fills us with his Holy Spirit so that we're ready to know Jesus and tell other people about him. Because you see, boys and girls, there are lots of people today who don't know Jesus. Maybe even in your class at school. And if we're Christians, Jesus calls us to tell people about Jesus and his amazing love for us. In fact, this is what Peter says. We'll hopefully get it up on the screen. Honor Christ and let him be the Lord of your life. Always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your always need to be ready to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior in our life and be ready to tell other people about him. I wonder, could we say this verse together and then we'll sing your hymn. After three, one, two, three. Honor Christ and let him be the Lord of your life. Always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your hope. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Brilliant. We're now going to sing a song, boys and girls, that reminds us to be bold, to be strong for God in all that we do. And there's actions to this, so could you join in with me and let's sing, be bold, be strong, twice.
brilliant. Thanks for joining in. And it is important that we are bold in today's age to stand up for Jesus and tell people about Jesus and the fact that God is with us no matter what. We're going to turn to our Bible reading now from Galatians chapter 1. You find that in Galatians chapter 1 in the New Testament. And as I said, it's a wonderful book that teaches us so much about our faith in Jesus, the gospel, the freedom that Christ gives and the importance of serving Christ wherever he has placed us. So Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to read the first 10 verses together. And we're mindful that this is God's word to us. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me, To the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what we, you accepted, Let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Amen. And we do thank God for the reading of his word. Well, let me tell you something about me. I dislike wearing glasses. Because without them, everything is blurry. In fact, it's very embarrassing when I go swimming. I used to go swimming to the Helton gym between my visits around Temple Patrick. One day after my 40 or so length or whatever it was, I got out to sit in one of the loungers. But just as I was about to sit on an unoccupied lounger, up came a voice, All right there, love, I'm sitting here. Needless to say, I moved away as quickly as I possibly could. But you see, without my glasses, things become unfocused. But when I wear them, I can see perfectly, even what sweet you're about to eat or whether you're nodding off. But you know the life, you know in the Christian life, we can sometimes have blurry vision of who God is And what his word actually teaches. Things can sometimes become unfocused. Especially in today's society. Often we can be tempted to pick and choose what we want to believe from God's word. Perhaps we take a liberal view on certain doctrinal matters. Or we go the other extreme and become very legalistic. But I want to suggest that each approach is wrong. In fact, Paul would agree. In our Bible reading, we see Paul writes to the Galatian church because they've moved quite significantly from what he taught them several years ago concerning Jesus and his gospel. You see, there's a group of people called the Judaizers, Jewish Christians, who believed and taught that the Old Testament ceremonial laws were still binding for Christians. Namely, circumcision. And they teach a a works-based salvation, which of course isn't true. For we know Christ came to fulfill all the requirements of the Old Testament laws through his death upon the cross and resurrection, as Paul had taught them when he set the church up around 48 AD. You see, Paul's main message is this. Trust no other gospel but Christ's. 
A lesson we all must heed, especially in our world filled with false ideologies, ideologies that have sadly infiltrated and destroyed many a church. Is it any wonder Paul told the Thessalonians to test everything and hold fast to what is good? But how can we? Well, Paul gives us three things to consider when we're seeking to trust no other gospel but Christ's. Firstly, we're to trust Christ-centered preaching. At my interview, I was asked, what do you see as characteristics of a good sermon? On hindsight, I probably should have said a good introduction, conclusion, and preferably close together. But you know, a good sermon must, as I said and Paul wrote, preach Christ and him crucified. A sermon that doesn't point to Christ and our need of him for salvation is not a sermon. Spurgeon said, a Christless sermon is a worthless sermon. It is like bread without flour. The essential element is lacking. And that's what was happening in Galatia. These Judaizers talked the talk, but they didn't walk the walk. They distorted God's truth. And no doubt they looked presentable with suits and leather-bound Bibles or whatever they wore in those days. But remember, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so Paul begins his letter by declaring his credentials, verse 1. Paul, an apostle sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, people probably thought, who's Paul? Sure, he persecuted Christians. But as Sproul writes, he was an apostle sent directly by Jesus Christ and had full authority over the fledgling church. You remember at Paul's conversion, he was blinded by the Lord's glory and was dramatically converted, with Jesus personally tasking him with preaching the gospel and building his church with the other disciples. And in verse 2, what do we read? And all the brothers with me. He not only had the backing of Christ, he had the backing of the church. Two days ago, I was ordained and installed as your minister in Jesus' name with the backing of the church. You see, as Christ calls, he equips and affirms through his church. Now, some may say Paul sounds rather boastful. If you have an older sibling, I'm sure they've taken the remote or told you to do something because I'm older than you. I have a younger sister, so I admit that was me. However, when she went to mum or dad and they spoke into the situation, that was different. They had authority. And similarly, Paul declares, my authority is not my own. It comes from the Lord and is backed by the church. You know, Martin Luther, who loved this book, as I said, it was instrumental in his faith and the Reformation. He concludes, We exalt our calling not to gain glory among men or money, satisfaction, favor, but because people need to be assured that the words we speak are the words of God. But how do we know it's God's word? Well, Paul in verses 3 to 5 presents the true gospel for us, that we can only receive grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus who makes this possible through giving himself for our sins and rescuing us from this present evil on the cross according to the Father's will. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. For Paul, it's all about Christ. We cannot save ourselves from sin or work our way into heaven. Only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Paul points the focus to Christ and encourages us to trust Christ-centered preaching alone. For anything else is false and cannot bring life or salvation. So what books are we reading? 
Whose preaching or podcasts are we listening to during the week? Are they Christ-centered and God-honoring? If not, then stay away. And if you need help or advice, please do come and speak to me. Because secondly, we're to believe Christ's gospel alone. Now that may sound obvious, but the reality is there are so many so-called gospels today. The health, wealth and prosperity gospel, the good living gospel, self-gospel, works-based gospel to name a few. Now we know, or we should know, that these are false. And the Galatians should have known too. But clearly these false teachers blurred their focus on the true gospel, persuading them of another. As Paul declares, verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to another gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Their focus isn't on Christ. They've turned away from God as the one who called them to life, who saved them from their sins by the grace of Christ as he died upon the cross. That's the gospel. It's all about Jesus and his finished work on the cross, plus nothing else. As top lady penned, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. The Galatians have fallen back into focusing on a legalistic work-based salvation. Like sadly many believe today. They hadn't fully understood the gospel and Paul's message. You see we cannot see of ourselves as I've said. Christ only can. And Paul condemns any teaching rights Keller that isn't based on the fact that we're too sinful to contribute to our salvation. We need a complete rescue. And we're only saved by faith, belief in Jesus' work, the grace of Christ, plus nothing else. Anything else is no gospel at all. In fact, Paul continues, verse 7, Evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. They're harsh words. And notice Paul says it twice, verse 9. He's deadly serious because only Christ's gospel leads to life. Anything else leads to eternal condemnation, death. Paul, in the strongest possible language, continues Keller, lays a plumb line for judging all truth claims. The standard is the gospel that he and all the apostles receive from Christ and taught. In other words, if God's word doesn't say it, then don't believe it. For God's word, as we heard on Friday, is holy, infallible, and inerrant, as the psalmist declared. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Paul may sound harsh, perhaps unloving, until you understand the repercussions for not believing in Christ's gospel. Guzik argues Paul's love was for the souls that were in danger of hell. If a, false, if a gospel is false and not any another good news at all, then it cannot save the lost. The word gospel means good news. And what is this good news? Well, the Bible warns us that we're undeserving of God's grace and forgiveness because of sin. We deserve to be punished for eternity in hell. But because of Christ's love for us, he willingly became like us without sin and died upon the cross to free us from sin's condemnation so that we might be clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. Not because of anything we do, but all because of what Christ has done. I wonder, do you believe this gospel? Is your focus on Christ and his gospel? For no other gospel but Christ's can see it. Which leads us finally to see we're to serve Christ, not man. 
One of the challenges I sometimes face is that of being a people pleaser. And perhaps you're the same. You want everyone to like you and you don't want to offend. But the reality is the gospel offends. It reveals our greatest problem, sin. We're all sinners who deserve nothing but to be punished and die. It reveals all the bad things in our lives, like a mirror showing us who we really are. And it's not out of focus. And no amount of makeup can hide it. That's why people reject Christ and his followers. They don't want to believe that there's anything wrong with them. Yet when we take the gospel seriously and understand the importance of why people need to hear it, then it should drive us to share the gospel. That amazing gospel from verses 3 to 5 that Paul wants the Galatians to remember. For the gospel, you see, also reveals our solution to sin. In that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He shed his blood upon the cross so that we who believe will be saved. But before salvation can take place, we need to repent, turn away from our sin and seek forgiveness. It's easy to be people pleasers rather than servants of Christ. But as Paul asks, verse 10, am I now trying to win the approval of men or God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Christ's gospel calls us to serve God, not man. It doesn't matter what others think, do or say. What matters is that we are saved by grace. Which consequently leads us to serve Christ, not man. Wilson writes, Paul knows that the Galatians aren't simply confused. They're being people pleasers, just like the Judaizers, rather than servants of Christ. How easy it is to sit back and laugh at the crude joke at work. Or hear the Lord's name taken in vain in class. To not stand against oppression, to reject the needy, to not stand up for Christ when friends or family badmouth him. We can all be tempted to do it. We all want the approval of man. We don't want to be different from our friends or family. We want to fit in with the crowd, be cool or popular, and we don't want to share the truth of of the gospel because we might offend. But as Christians, we are meant to be different. To stand up and stand up for Christ, to be salt and light in our dark world. And that's why Paul asks, who are we trying to please? Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot do it any more than water and oil can mix together. So let me ask with Paul and Christ, who are we trying to please? Man or God? Are we serving Christ or man? Who are we focusing on? And yes, we must be careful of falling into the legalistic trap of the Judaizers of a salvation plus works attitude. But we're also called to serve Christ and obey his commandments. But we all know we cannot achieve this. Yet that doesn't mean that we aren't to try to live as Christ would want us. The truth of the gospel, however, is that Christ has achieved the law of God. He fulfills the law's commands, shedding his blood as the final sacrifice for our sins. So that when we hear Christ's gospel preach and repent from our sins and believe in his gospel alone, then we know it is finished. We're saved, brought into fellowship with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're at peace with God and each other. So let's be faithful servants of Christ For there's no other gospel but Christ and everyone needs to hear it. To conclude, there's an old gospel hymn that sums up Paul's message. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his own dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. 
I'd rather be true to his holy name. I wonder, is this true for you? Are we trusting Christ-centered preaching? Are we believing Christ's gospel alone? Are we serving Christ, not man? Paul says, by this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Let us focus, brothers and sisters, on no other gospel but Christ's. Amen. Let's come to God in our prayers of thanks and intercession. Oh, Heavenly Father, there is much to give you thanks for today. Your goodness, your love, grace, mercy and peace. Your faithfulness, leading, guiding and strength. We thank you for your word and the truth, hope and life it brings. We thank you for Christ's gospel, which is good news for all. We thank you for our salvation made possible through Christ's death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. We praise you for the Holy Spirit who ministers, comforts and guides. Lord, we ask you to help us to be bold and share your amazing gospel to all peoples. May we be salt and light into our world. Father, we praise you for the start of a new ministry here in Clagan and indeed in Order. Giving you thanks for how you've led and guided us through this whole process. We thank you for Tyrone Presbytery, for Mark and Hugh, and all who've provided support and guidance over this time of vacancy. We pray now that you would lead our paths into righteousness' sake. May we build upon the faithful evangelical witness that has gone before. Help me as minister to faithfully fulfill the vows that I made on Friday night to care, pastor, pray for and love these dear flocks. And I pray for the Kirk Sessions, committees, leaders and each member that they too would fulfill the vows they made. Give us all guidance and wisdom as we move things forward in the autumn. May we all work together for the sake of the gospel. May we share Christ's hope and love to all we meet that many would come to faith and that we in Christ will be built up and better equipped to serve him. God, we think of our schools, colleges and universities, giving you thanks for the teachers, lecturers, staff and students. We pray that they all alike will be able to adjust quickly to all the changes in place. We ask for protection against COVID and guidance as they seek to move forward. Father, bless our young people. Keep them from the tempter's snare. Go before them and hem them in with your wings of protection. For their teachers and lecturers, may they be conscious of your presence with them. And may they influence our children and young people for good. We thank of our students for ministry, deaconesses, youth workers, licentiates and assistant ministers, training at Union College. And we pray that you would go before them and help them in their studies as term resumes again. Be with the faculty, Gordon as principal, David Leach as professor of ministry, and all who will teach. Help them as they, as they train these people, young and older, for the service of Christ. Be with all who became eligible last Wednesday and lead them to the right congregations so that they can faithfully serve you. And Father, we remember those who face persecution and war across our world. In particular, we think of this terrible situation in Afghanistan. O oh Lord, it grieves us to see the loss of so many lives and the sheer disrespect shown towards people, in particular women. We pray for your intervention, that you would bring justice and peace, that you would thwart the evil one's schemes in Jesus' name. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would protect them, go before them, help them to know your peace which surpasses all understanding, and may they lean on Christ and the promises of your gospel. And finally, Father, we remember all in our congregation who are struggling for whatever reason, whether that be physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, and or spiritually, for no, those who mourn the loss of a loved one, particularly those connected to the Lee's family, those who are struggling with relationships or are worrying, a, a worrying diagnosis has come their way. 
O Lord, whatever the situation, we bring it to you in prayer, asking that your mercy and grace would be poured out upon them. May they know the comfort they need and the strength to carry on. And may we, as their church family, help in what way we can to show the love of Christ to each person. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, we conclude our service of worship together as we sing our closing hymn. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Hide me now, my refuge be. Let the water and the blood from your wounded side which flowed be for sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. What a hymn of hope that we have in Jesus Christ and his gospel. Let us stand to sing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with you and your families this day, and then forevermore. Amen.